Well, thank you all for coming tonight. It's wonderful to be in the presence of a lot of people who share my love and fascination with Madagascar. I haven't spent nearly enough time in the country, but I've spent some time in the country. So we're going to look at a fascinating episode in Madagascar's history in the early part of the 19th century. And um, I credit Sir Mervyn Brown, I'll say a little bit about him in a moment, with um, inspiring me to write this book, Mission to Madagascar, The Sergeant. This is a guy called James Hasty, who you will be meeting in, in a few moments. Um, Sergeant the King and the Slave Trade. So, just very briefly here, um, um, I made six or seven trips to Madagascar over about a three-year period on a project for UNICEF. Here I am somewhere in Andasibe Bay National Park, and there is a lever there, and that's a close-up of a lever. So I'll be, I'll be there, I'll be there. This is a project for UNICEF, um, and I travelled as much as I could. These were relatively short trips, but I had some fascinating encounters with people. I did an overland trip from Tana to, uh, to Toliara um, because Air Madagascar was on strike. I couldn't fly. Uh, so um, I, I met a lot of people, uh, including colleagues from the University of Antananarivo, and um, became fascinated by the country and its culture. And then I thought, I need to know a bit more about the history. And so, um, where will I go? But of course, to some everybody. I love this portrait of him. This is a portrait everybody uses here. And he's looking so distinguished and so smart. And it is still amazing to me, I was talking to Hillary earlier about this, that you know he was able, while having a full-time diplomatic job, to do the research. And it's very, very impressive research for the history of Madagascar and then a couple of editions of that. I mean, as, as political, diplomatic, and military histories of the country go, I think it has never been equal. Nobody's done anything like that. There'll be other histories of Madagascar, but in terms of you know, his research, it still remains very, very impressive. So I met Sir Mervyn in 2018 uh, at his home. Uh, I invited him out for lunch, but he said, oh, I'm not getting out too much these days, so come over. And we had a fascinating conversation. Um, I really had no particular purpose to this interview. I mean, I'm a journalist by training and then became an academic, but I was just fascinated by the book and by his career. And at some point there, I asked him a really stupid question. I said, <laughs> well, in writing the history of Madagascar, was there any character who you felt sort of stood out, you would have liked to have done some more work on it? He said, this guy, this person, James Hasty, really interesting person, very important for anglo malagasy relations. So I kind of made a note, and then completely forgot about it. And then came COVID. And, um, you know, I, I write travel narratives, uh, books on travel history and culture, traveled quite a lot myself in Asia and Africa, and suddenly I couldn't travel. How am I going to fulfill my need to write? Well, let me try to do somebody else's travel narrative. And Suburban had said, James Hasty wrote these journals. They're over in the National Archives. Go look at them. And I thought, ah, this is another travel narrative I can tell. So um, these are the books that I write. As I say, I had to, I re suddenly remembered Hasty. I had that note there. And so I thought, let's have a look at that. So just a little background here. Um, we, I was talking to somebody a little earlier about Europeans um, and attempts to establish trading settlements in Madagascar. Well, really until the French uh, came at the end of the 19th century, uh, no colonial power was successful at doing that. The clans were very, very hostile to them. You know, a settlement would last a couple of years. You know, uh, the, you know the Dutch were there, the, you know, the British tried, uh, the French tried, but nobody really established a trading group. The only successful group were the pirates, okay, up, who established 
settlements up near Ile Saint Marie. And uh, they, from there, they raided ships that were all on the sea lanes to India, uh, coming around the Cape of Good Hope, to British India. And they also ventured further north, and they preyed on ships that were coming from India for the Hajj in Mecca. So the pirates settled pretty well and intermarried until they were kind of kicked out and sent back to the Caribbean. And there's that, uh, that's the pirate graveyard in Ile Saint-Marie. So no colonial power really was able to establish a significant presence there. Um, so um, I'm going to use the word over. Most of you will use the word mariner, I know, for uh, the, the clans predominant in the, in the highlands. By the end of the 19th century, the mariner, the over, were the rising military power in Madagascar. There were the Sakalava kingdoms um, on, uh, on, uh, on the west, uh, but the, um, the clans, the mariner clans, the over clans had become united. They were the rising military power, and this becomes very significant for the story. Um, um, I wanted just to set a little background here. This is from a really good collection of maps uh, based on historical research about the slave trade. The most focus on the slave trade has been on the transatlantic slave trade, understandably, to the United States, the Caribbean, to Brazil, and to South America. Right? There. Less looked at has been the slave trade around the Indian Ocean, which in fact is a lot older and uh, where the historical records are not as good. But as you will see from uh, this, um, it's been going on since probably the second century AD, much older than the transatlantic slave trade. And um, in the 19th century, demand for slaves was rising, um, and particularly on some of the islands around the Indian Ocean, uh, where there were plantation economies, including Mauritius and Bourbon, the Mascarene islands. Um, but there's really very, very little documentation on this as compared with the documentation that's been done for the transatlantic slave trade, where they have extensive ships manifests and things like that. Um, so this is sort of indicates some of the rats there. And, um, Zanzibar was probably the major slave port on the east coast of Africa, um, sending slaves north um, to the Arabian Peninsula uh, and to India there, were also trans-Saharan uh, slave routes. But I'm interested in the bit at the bottom, the bit that involves Madagascar there. And so Mauritius and Réunion, Bourbon, as it was then, the plantation economies there, depended completely on slave labor. And I actually disagree a little bit with some of the arrows on here. Maybe there were some slaves going from Madagascar to Mozambique, but there were also a lot coming the other way. Um, this is, based on the research that I've done and secondary sources, the main trade routes here. And so uh, slaves are being sent directly from the east coast ports, uh, from uh, Tamatav, today Tomasina, and from Fulquant, uh, today Mahavalona, excuse my pronunciation here. They're being sent directly. But there was also a slave trade across the Mozambique travel channel, with slaves being sold particularly into Majunga, where Arab slave traders control the trade. And so some of them shipped to Zanzibar, and there was a very interesting sort of, shall we say, um, bypass to um, the, the trade there via the Seychelles. Um, when the British took over the Seychelles, took over Mauritius during the Napoleonic Wars, the Seychelles were technically a dependency of Mauritius. So because, you know, 
the British Navy was boarding slave trading ships that were coming directly from the east coast of Madagascar. Some of the slave traders sent them up to the Seychelles, which was really not patrolled at all, had them registered as slaves there, and then shipped them down to uh, Port Louis in Mauritius um, and sold them on the slave market because they were officially registered as slaves. This is now, this is post-1807 when Britain abolished the slave trade, didn't abolish slavery, that didn't come until 1838, abolished the slave trade, and um, so, and the Navy was out to stop the slave trade directly. So, it was quite interesting, this sort of legal dodge that was made. Slaves were bought and sold, you know, during the British administration in Mauritius, uh, some of them shipped illegally by the Seychelles, given false documentation, then shipped to, shipped, to, shipped to Mauritius. And look at the geography of Mauritius as well. Uh, we'll come to the uh, Hasty and the Governor in a moment there, but Mauritius, I don't know if any of you have been there, it's full of little inlets and coves and things like that. You know, absolutely impossible to stop the smuggling of slaves at night into little isolated places there. And the British don't have the troops or the ships to really police the island. Um, so, uh, you're all familiar with his name, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm not joking about this, but actually uh, you, you need to think about the names of European monarchs, you know. You know, King George, Duke of so-and-so, uh, Viscount of so-and-so. In, in Malagasy, all the names, all the names went, went together. And so this is the king who at the end of the 19th century united the clans or, you know, defeated the rival clans, brought them all together into the United King, United Mariner over Kingdom, which then started to expand through the island through his son, Radama. And um, it's important to remember here how the slave trade was uh, the part it played in, shall we say, the economy. Uh, uh, it seems a terrible thing to say here, but the Andriana, the nobles and the military commanders depended on the sale of war captives for income. And the king, uh, um, uh, king, you know, um, taxed this traffic, this was money for the royal treasury, and so Andrea Nampuin and Narina, uh, even though he was hostile to European influences, he welcomed French slave traders to his court. So in 1810 he dies, and reportedly, you know, this a French historian wrote this down, what can we believe, you know, the last words were, the sea shall be the border of my rice fields. In other words, the Highland Kingdom wants to expand to the coast. And Radama, his 17-year-old son, um, is given the responsibility of expanding the kingdom there. And there are a few revolts that pop up, as often happens when you know, there's a succession issue ruthlessly put down. And Radama embarks immediately on military campaigns around the island. And um, he tries to um, uh, go to the Sakalami Manabe kingdom in the southwest. Um, if you know the geography there, uh, it's, um, it's desert, it's scrub, you know, there's not a lot to live on down there. The army suffers huge losses, mostly from hunger and disease. But uh, Rodama will pursue annual campaigns, almost annual campaigns against the Sakalara Manabe kingdom. So he's out on this mission to bring the whole island, or as much as he can, under control. Um, so here's Radama, and I, I use these two portraits here to sort of contrast him. The first one is from a book some of you are probably pretty familiar with, William Ellis, the missionary historian, his history of Madagascar. And he, you know, here's Radama in his traditional silk lumber. Looks very patriarchal. Looks very, you know, you know, uh, he's got his, you know, hair stylishly curled. Uh, looks sort of very patriarchal. 
you know, a loving father of his people. I think the portrait on the right by the Mauritius painter André Coppal probably sums him up a little better. He wanted to be Napoleon, okay? you know, and so he wanted to be a European monarch, and so here he is dressed up in military gear here, and uh, um, you know, uh, re ready to campaign. So that was his ambition, and interestingly enough, Hasty will kind of use his ambition to be a civilized monarch uh, in his negotiations. So um, he rules from um, Tanner in the, uh, in the Central Highlands, which has become an important commercial capital uh, by the early 19th century. It's where a lot of trade routes crossed. It's where slave markets were. Um, and he rules from the Rome of the palace at the top of the hill, at the top of the ridge. And there's this fascinating little map. You probably can't see it here, but I mean, it's kind of, you know, the, the Rome of the palace was on the top ridge there. I mean, you, you, you could, if you go to Tanner, you'll sort of see where it, where it was. And then there's um, uh, below that, and I've been to the place, you probably have to, there's the cliff from which the criminals are thrown. This was rough justice in those times. Uh, the criminals, they were thrown over the cliff. Anyway, yeah. So, so it's a, it's sort of, Radam is pretty interesting because he's very outward looking in some ways, o open to all sorts of other influences, but there's this real sort of historical cruel trait to his character. So here come the British. <laughs> so the 1810, they capture Mauritius and Bourbon during the Napoleonic War. Uh, but you know, the British don't want to commit too many resources to this. So they say to the French settlers, you can keep your language, you can keep your Catholic religion, uh, you can keep your slaves, okay? They're not going to interfere in any way. And so the British ships start trying to interdict the slave trade from Madagascar. But the smuggling continues. As I said, that map of Mauritius shows all sorts of places where you can smuggle pay into. And then um, at the Treaty of Paris, the island of Bourbon, Réunion today, is restored to France. Now, Hasty comes on the scene in 1816 as a disastrous fire in Port Louis, the capital of Mauritius, starts in, um, you know, with a lot of wooden houses, spreads very, very quickly. Um, uh, but here's the governor's quandary here. What's a governor to do? Uh, so Mauritius is really important. It's on this strategic location on the sea lanes to India, um, and the French and others are raiding British ships. He's under pressure from London to stop the smuggling of slaves, but, but he really doesn't have the, the soldiers or the ships to, um, to deal with it. And at the same time, the demand for slaves is rising because of the plantation economy, demand for sugar is rising. So what's a governor to do, okay? Invade Madagascar? That's out of the question, you know? Uh, try to go for diplomacy with all of these different clans? That's going to take years, lots of gifts, okay? So he decides very, very strategically we're going to try to make an alliance with the up-and-coming military power, the over, the mariner in the highlands. The Sakalava are in decline, it's, and it's the, this young king, Radama, we're going to try to bring him on board there. So he sends a couple of missions out, and for various reasons they fail to achieve his aims. Um, and so then... He comes on the scene, and it's a remarkable story here. He, you know, he's, he's from County Cork in Ireland. He has a pretty good education, but, you know, he's, you know, he's dissatisfied. He, he wants to break away, so he runs away from home and joins the army, okay? And is shipped out to India, and during the Napoleonic Wars, his, his regiment is redeployed to Mauritius after Napoleon returns to Paris, the, Governor Farquhar is kind of worried about a revolt from the French settlers, so they ship his regiment out there. So he ends up in, in Port Louis, 
uh, and the fire happens and he shows incredible bravery. He puts up a ladder to government house and he climbs up the ladder and the, the Indian sepoys are passing up buckets of water and he's putting out the fire. He's, you know, uh, you know, he plays a major part in stopping the fire spreading and destroying the government building and destroying other houses. So he comes to the governor's attention. Bright guy, bright guy, shows initiative here. Recently, the two brothers, younger brothers of Radama, had arrived with one of the missions sent to Madagascar for an education. And so he's named, uh, he's educated, he, you know, he's had a really good education, more than some of the commissioned officers. He becomes tutor to the princes. And he's then named as the assistant to the British agent Thomas Pye who is supposed to do the third mission uh, to the court of Radama in July 1817. Um, I'm going to pick up the story here from another journal. This is a journal from, uh, a, mil uh, from a naval engineer called Thomas Locke Lewis. Now, tomorrow night I'm presenting at King's College London Library, uh, which has his, his journal here. But it, it's kind of it's, uh, this sort of is the pre, you know, this kind of sells the pre-story. So um, Lewis and Hasty and the princes arrive in July, um, 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 the, on June the 29th. They arrive in Tamataf to Amasina in the evening with Atafiki and Rahome, the brothers of Radama, the supreme chief or king of, of, of the island of Alaska, you know, came alongside. Okay. The princes have been residing for some months with His Excellency Mr. Farquhar, the governor. The eldest was 15 years of age and rather an implacable disposition, uh, whilst that of his brother, two years younger, was mild and tractable. I love these comments. <laughs> uh, but Mr. Hasty was employed as guardian to the princes during, during their residence. So they're arriving here and Lewis in fact goes out with another officer on a sort of reconnaissance mission um, to see what's going to happen um, now oh, I'm going to come back to that in a moment I, I sh what's happening at this stage is that Radama with his army is literally at the gates if the word gates you know at the entrance to Tamata which is this important port uh, on the east coast and what he's trying to do is he's trying to open a route to the east coast for the export of slaves but you know he does not control the east coast so he's trying to march against um, the local chief whose name is Jean René and, and either ally with him or whatever and reportedly he has an army of 30,000 now we need to take that number with a large grain of salt or whatever the appropriate Malagasy spice is there because um, I think Hasty once described the, uh, the army as um, oh let's see um, a heavily laden mob of both sexes and all ages so, <laughs> so you know it, this is not 30,000 trained soldiers you know these are, these, are, these are people who've been farmers most of the year, and they've got their wives and their slaves and who else coming along. So there's 30,000 people there, but they're not all fighting soldiers. But anyway, um, um, you know, it was one. So at this point, I need to try to pick up Hasty's story, because Hasty's journal begins in July 1817. So... Um, so Mervyn said, oh, just go down to the National Archives, you'll find it there. Well, unfortunately, look at the thing right, the record is missing and is unavailable. It's, um, so Mervyn used these records here, but at some point, this journal went missing. Oh dear. No, no, no. <laughs> Another historian used it, but then when the historian Pierre Larson got to it, it was missing. So, so, so what, what to do here? Well, fortunately, um, there is this. 
the Académie Malgache did a translation in 1903 of this journal for the benefit of its members. Now, this does raise some interesting issues. Firstly, it's been translated into French, and I now translate it back into English, so some things may get lost in translation. There's also extensive annotation there about place names. Oh, we think it's such and such a place, but it could be somewhere else and things like that. So there are some issues with this as a historical source, but it's all you've got. It's all you've got. Okay? So, so I use this to trace Hastie's first months here. So he travels with gifts for the... Oh, I, I should say. He becomes the leader of the mission because Pi to whom he was assistant, falls ill with malaria, which a lot of people happen to fall ill with, the Malagasy fever, as they call it, and uh, he has to go back to Mauritius. So suddenly Hasty, this 30-year-old sergeant with no diplomatic experience, no mission experience, your job, go and negotiate a, a treaty to end the slave trade. Good luck. <laughs> So Hasty, with his party of um, uh, porters, who are called Mamit, um, travels. I'm just going to sort of show, show the. Well, he travels by canoe across the Pangalan, the series of lagoons. There's now a canal there, but there was no canal there. So there were rough portages between the lagoons. He comes down to the uh, Iharoka River and uh, rendezvous with Radama. Um, who has sort of withdrawn from uh, Tamatar and signed a treaty there. And then it's, it's, um, it's basically close to the present day route of uh, Route Nationale de uh, there. Some, somewhat close, somewhat close. So, um, but he's doing it on foot most of the time. Um, so, Later on, the missionaries travel by Sagancha, Filangiana, okay? Uh, but uh, you know, Hasty, Hasty was on foot with uh, his uh, porters with him. And he was going through a region which had been devastated by war because Jean René's armies or forces had been fighting and Radama's forces had been fighting and there were other players in there. It's very confusing. So villages were burned, there was very little to eat, it was very, very hazardous. Um, he's travelling across these coastal lagoons where the wind can sweep up the waves. He loses a horse. He's brought horses with him, which is the first person to bring horses to Madagascar and the prize horse for the king drowns. He's got some others. Then there's this exhausting uh, ascent through the foothills and the tropical rainforest of the highlands. At the same time, he is required, and he does this really well, to record, and the correspondence from Farquhar's chief secretary says, in the smallest details, everything that you can learn. Which is why Hastie's journals are so important. It's the most comprehensive account of all sorts of things in early 19th century Madagascar, the landscape, agriculture, you know, iron foundries, uh, um, uh, trees, plant life, um, house construction. I mean, the list goes on. He wrote everything down. He wrote everything down because he had been instructed to record everything in the smallest details, which makes it such a valuable resource. So. Um, um, he is keeping a daily journal with many details there. Now, it was a very, very, this first journey was a very hazardous one. I've got a few quotes here. Uh, the first door in his porters, the Mamit. Uh, I mean, he is, he's on his own. I mean, he has no assistant and he has to deal with them and they complain a lot. And he's going through this region, especially, uh, well, really until he reaches the highlands where there's, you know, which have been ravaged by war, um, money can't buy anything, and then up, down, up, down, thick fog, rains all the time. I said, if this is a good season for travel in this country, and this is in July, you know, this is not in the official rainy season, I assert it must be impossible to proceed in the bank. It's a tough trip. Um, so, he eventually makes it 
to um, Tananarive Tana on August the 5th. And the king, Radhava, sent messenger ahead saying, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, you know, I want you to be here for my birthday. My birthday. And he goes, okay, I'll hurry up. And he gets there, and the king says, no, wait, wait, wait. Don't come, don't come up the hill to the capital yet. We have to wait. Um, and so he's arriving not on the king's birthday, but on the Malagasy New Year, uh, the Thangdorana. And what then happens is a really interesting choreography which has been well documented by the, the historian Pierre Larson about how Radama uses Hasty in his power struggle against his father's advisors, the, uh, the Namada, who are very, very powerful and also depend on the slave trade. And so what Radama does is he gives Hasty literally pole position, front row seat for the ritual slaughter of cattle and the royal bathing and all of the other rituals that go on over this period of time. And the message he's sending is, I want to make an alliance with the British and you, the Namana, your advisors, the military commanders, you know, uh, you're going to lose power, you're going to lose influence here. So that's the message he's sending. I mean, Hasty doesn't get this. You know, I mean, he doesn't know anything about Malagasy culture at all. He's arrived, he kind of figures that the king's sort of using him in some way, but his most important thing to do is to build a relationship with the king. So he goes with the show, so to speak, and uh, um, shows up at every event. So cultural stage management of an international alliance. Um, and this is typical of Hastie's description. So here he's describing uh, a portion of his description, it's much longer than this, the, the houses in the courtyard. And I mean, you know, even when he stopped overnight at some chief's house, apparently he would measure how long the beams were and how high things were. I mean, there's an incredible amount of detail in, the, in these descriptions. And so he's talking about yeah, ultimately, from places of what cut that with half inch peak, he's facing the joint. Yeah, I guess he's measuring everything. I mean, later on uh, in 1824, we did have in the campaign, he has a thermometer the first time. We have the first real scientific evidence of how hot it was in Madagascar, or at least in northwest Madagascar, in 1824. But Hasty would take a reading inside his tent and outside his tent. Like, until his thermometer broke at that ending. Uh, anyway, so it's a complicated three month negotiation. And he thinks he's convinced the king to um, abolish the slave trade, issue some ban. And then the king comes back and says, I don't know about that. It's part of our culture, you know. My people would never stand for it. By his people, he doesn't mean his people in general, he means the Namana the advisors, the powerful advisors, and the military commanders. So eventually, Hasty comes to a deal with him. He said, OK, you're going to lose money from the royal treasury if we abolish the slave trade. How about we, the British, compensate you with supplies, military supplies, and training for the army? There's already um, a sergeant there who'd come on a previous mission who started military training with that, you know, mob of all ages and sexes <laughs> to try to turn them into a professional army. So Radama accepts this and so he's making an alliance with the British against the advice of his advisors. He's running a risk here and at Tamatav in 1817 in October, Hasty is not of enough rank to sign the treaty himself even though he's done all the work they have to bring in um, a couple of ship's captains with appropriate rank to do it. So, the export of slaves is banned from Rotana's territories, but nothing happens with the internal slave trade. Slaves are bought and sold. Um, and uh, Hasty is very, very careful to say, well, we, we must stop this inhuman practice of exporting slaves for the plantations, but we will not interfere in your culture and your customs. So, do what you like in your own country. In fact, he makes the argument that 
hey, slaves can build roads and things like that. Keep them here. Just don't export them. It's, a, it's a quite an interesting tack that he takes there. Anyway, so, um, so we think everything has gone together. And um, Hasty goes back to Mauritius, and Farquhar congratulates him on the successful negotiation of the treaty. And then um, Farquhar goes back to England. He tries to run for by-election for somewhere in Kent, I think, and is soundly defeated, but he's unleaded. And Hasty returns to Madagascar, um, and he's carrying more gifts for the king. And it's really curious because he doesn't sort of seem to meet, there are no messengers from the king. When he arrives in Tana, it's in the middle of a smallpox epidemic, which claimed thousands of lives in the Highlands. And I don't want to get too much into the medical details, and I'm certainly not a doctor, um, but the, basically what they did at that time to try to stop people from getting smallpox was to or take a scab or something with smallpox and inject um, uh, somebody else to try to give them that protection, which sometimes works, but sometimes a person contracted smallpox and died. So the cowpox vaccine had been developed at that point. Hasty sends a letter and he gets cowpox vaccine from Mauritius. He begins vaccinations and he actually saves, saves all our lives. Meanwhile, there are rumours that the guy who's taken over from Fakwa in his absence, I think, Major General Gage John Hall, doesn't trust what's happened. He thinks that Fakwa is just trying to make nice with London, and he doesn't trust Radama because there are still slaves being exported to Mauritius, but they're not necessarily coming from areas that Radama controls. So, but you know, to Hall, it's all Madagascar, you know. And, and Rodolfo is responsible for it all. So, you know, he fires Hasty, and Rodolfo feels totally de deceived. He hasn't received his first supply of, of muskets and gunpowder and uniforms for his soldiers, and he orders the resumption of the slave trade. Uh, Farquhar returns in 1820, wants to revive the treaty. But how are you going to revive the treaty here when you've already broken it essentially by not, you know, British have not have broken it by not living up to their side of it, buying the guns and muskets uh, which Radama would use to conquer more of the island. So, um, Hasty returns in, with uh, orders from Fakwa to try to um, revive the treaty. And I use this quote, this is from the Journal of King's College London, to kind of show you know, kind of what he packed for the trip. It's fairly complicated, you know. Not like throwing a few things in the suitcase here. If you're going to go and try to revive a treaty, you've got to take a bit more stuff along here. So I want to point to a couple of things here. 140 pieces of blue cloth, 100 pieces of white cloth, 100, well, 100 gallons of rum, we know where that goes, 250 pieces of pepper. Okay, handkerchiefs. The main medium of exchange at that time, there were Spanish silver dollars which were used, but the main medium of exchange in Madagascar at that time was cloth in like five, um, five foot, five, six foot lengths. You know, I've been trying to find out exactly what a piece is and there are various sources on that. So this is what he pays, you know. He, you know, he stops for a night, you know, he pays with pieces of cloth for lodging, for food for his porters, um, you know, he, um, this is the main medium of state. So he's taken a lot of cloth with him, most of which has come from India by merchants in, in Mauritius. And then he's taking, um, I mean, handkerchiefs are not small handkerchiefs, they're quite large, more like scarves, okay? Then there's plate for the king, plate for the princes, um, and oh, a trunk of clothes for Brady the drill. This is Sergeant Brady. This is the sergeant who's working with the army there. Um, and he embarks on the government schooner with the Reverend W as a mistake. His name was David Jones. This is the first missionary from the London Missionary Society to go to Madagascar. Okay, um, and. Um, you know, who knows what's going to happen there? How will a missionary be welcomed here? So, you know, so then he 
Um, uh, then he arrives, and you know, there's a, a, a bunch of French on the beach who go, oh shoot, the British are back, and they leave. <laughs> uh, and the, the chief, Jean René, the local warlord, welcomes him. Um, and um, then there's some other discussion. There's a pretty typical. I, I point to the left thing here. He's brought more horses, okay? I mean, horses are really important here. I mean, Hasty starts off walking, you know, but you know, by the time we get to 1823, he's definitely riding, and so is the king. The king loves the horses, okay? But they've sent slaves with the horses from Mauritius who don't know what they're doing. And they permitted one to escape this morning, which I fortunately recovered at a pri premium of five pieces of Patna. Patna was an expensive printed cloth. You had to pay a lot to get that horse back. So he hires some local people to deal with the horses. But these are fairly typical of some of, the, some of these entries here. So he gets back to Tana, and, uh, you know, um, and Madame is polite to him. We don't trust him. I mean, the English have, you know, broken the treaty. And there's this sort of technical argument. Yes, the treaty was signed, but King George didn't sign it, so it really wasn't official, okay? Uh, but, uh, but um, uh, so, you know, he, he's arriving with the missionary, and again, there's another long <coughs> negotiation, but there's a great quote over here which I use, you know. Uh, um, Rodama says to him, he says, in our language, we have a new proverb. And what is that? If somebody has deceived somebody else, we call them false as the English. Okay? <laughs> You'll deceive us. So, Hasty has to come to another deal. And what Rodama wants most is to modernize the economy. He wants to have, you know, this is a traditional subsistence economy. There's a little bit of iron making and things like that. But he really wants to his people to be trained in various skills. So this is where the missionaries come in, the missionary artisans, right? Um, um, or um, and just other artisans. So brick making, blacksmithing, printing, various trades. Rodin was very, very interested in that. So Hasty agrees to quote unquote additional articles to the treaty, which are going to bring in artisans. He also wants to have boys set for training in military band. Now, presumably, he's got a nice professional army and he'd need a good military band to go with him, right? And then, most interestingly, and uh, uh, this was well documented in a recent book by the historian Wynne Campbell, a group comes to England, actually, uh, a group of um, sons of Adriana, sons of nobles, uh, accompanied by an interesting guy called Ratafi, the prime minister, uh, who's also Radama's brother-in-law? Uh, they come. They they come to England on a short mission. It's uh, it's been it's a kind of a fascinating thing to learn to learn traits like how to make gunpowder, like in, useful things like that. Um, so deal is done. Radama reissues his proclamation banning the slave trade, and this time it sticks. Um, and the British have now got various agents here and they report that slave traders are coming back from the highlands. They have not been able to acquire slaves. And the way the, you know, the economics of this was that the slave traders bought cloth in Mauritius or in Bourbon on credit from merchants. Right? So they paid for it there and then they used it to buy slaves and make a profit. Well, Suddenly, they're there in Madagascar and they're stuck with all this cloth that they can't get rid of. And so the price of cloth goes down, you know, it's a market glut, and they make a, they've lost a lot of money. So it's become not just a band, but become economically uh, unviable to try to get trade. And another missionary society continues to send artisans, but there are still areas of the island outside Radama's control where the slave trade continues, particularly in the northwest, uh, the Arab trading port of Majunga, which is bringing in slaves from uh, across the Mozambique Channel. Um, so, um, 
this is, and I'll, t I'll talk a little bit about the origin of this journal here. This is a guy called Raphael Alari. I don't think he travelled dressed this way. It's a little fancy for travel. Uh, uh, this is from Ellis's um, uh, book, History of Madagascar. But Rodin was keen to establish trading posts, agricultural and commercial establishments on the coast. He's trying to expand out of the highlands and, and you know, establish trading settlements. So he sends Hastie and Rafael Alari off uh, to the southeast coast to see if there are possibilities there. What Hastie is doing a lot of the time is he's looking at an estuary or he's looking at a peninsular anchorage. Where could ships anchor? Would they have to anchor out on the coral reef? Could they get closer in land? Is the water too rough and things like that? He's doing what a lot of 19th century, especially military travellers did, which is to figure out where it would be possible to establish trading settlements. So they go down there, they have a bit of trouble with the local chiefs and things like that, and they won't rent them canoes and they charge them too much. I mean, they go as far south as Malanjari, and, Radha, and Hasty comes up with a couple of possible places, but in the end, uh, they reject, um, you know, Radama sort of rejects this, and the eventual trading settlement is established at Full Point, uh, Avelona. And, but I want to come back to say a little bit about the origin of this journal a little bit later. So, Radama now armed with muskets and gunpowder and fine uniforms and with a more professional army is ready to move against um, the clans in the, in the, in the, in the northeast and, uh, and then in 1824 the northwest. So, um, it's a kind of interesting thing that happens here, and Hastie is with him all the time. Hastie is now his principal advisor, you know, political and military as well. So a couple of army corps go ahead and sort of scare the people a bit and take some captives, and then Radama and Hastie and the palace guard follow, and they meet with the chiefs, and they, and they have them take oaths of allegiance, and they give them certificates and things like that. So there are a lot of uh, what are called cabarets, you know, formal meetings there. Um, so, you know, they basically agree to submit to Radar, uh, bringing this region kind of under his control. And Hastie's making all of these notes on <coughs> potential, you know, areas for agriculture, the timber resources, extensive, extensive notes. So they get as far um, sort of north of the Bay of Antogil uh, to uh, Cape of Angon Sea, which was actually a place where slave traders had sent slaves north of the Seychelles. Now, I have to say that their route back is somewhat speculative here, and I'll say a little bit about the maps here. Hasty did not draw any maps. Okay, um, uh, he named a lot of places, and a lot of those place names have changed, and nobody really knows what he's talking about anymore. So we know pretty well where he's going up the coast. When we get in land here, I, my cartographer and I, and I, 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 I said to her, Anna, I want to sort of reproduce the kind of map that Hasty would have drawn if he'd drawn a map. Okay, so we look very closely at how early 19th century topographical features were represented, how they represented mountains and rivers and things like that. I think she did a quite a good job there. But at this point, coming in land, we have a few reference points. We know they go to Lake Aleutra because there's a sort of military engagement there. But, you know, and so we, you know, we look at it and we go, okay, they're not going to go over mountains if they have to. You know, their guides are going to take them on the easiest route. So this is a somewhat speculative route in part, so especially in the northern part there. But again, you know, it's a very expensive campaign, a lot of soldiers falling sick, dying of malaria. And then in 1824, um, Radama moves against the Arab slave traders of Majonga. This is the, this is the um, Sakhalava Boina kingdom, or Boyana kingdom to the north. Um, and this is a, quite important because the Arab slave traders, um, under the protection of the Sakhalava kings, um, are bringing slaves across from Mozambique 
and they're doing one of two things. They're exporting them north on their dows to the slave market of Zanzibar, or they're actually marching them across the island to re-export to Mauritius and Bourbon at that point. And there is, again, the economics of this, the generic name for an African slave at that time was a Mozambique or a Mozambican. Indeed, Hasty had one. He didn't own that slave, but he was sort of assigned to him, and they actually developed a good relationship. So, Majunga was really important. So, um, Radama marches north. Uh, by this time, his army is a lot smaller and more professional. It's about 14,000, about half that he <laughs> needed on a previous expedition. And Hasty comments about how the troops sort of set up their tents and the organization of the army. So it's a much more professional, better armed army than, than, than the rabble <laughs> that had gone out before. Um, so they, they capture Majunga, uh, the, um, the, 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 the Andren Saul, who's the king of the northern Sakalava, the Boyana kingdom. Well, he's kind of paid off, pensioned off. Shall we say, you know, we'll give you a nice house here, we'll give you some money and no trouble, please. Uh, and then, tragically, things fall apart for Hasty. He suffers a series of falls and accidents, dies in Tana in uh, 1826, age of 40. Uh, Radama is devastated. I mean, you know, he, uh, he, you know, he writes that he's lost his great friend, he's got great advisor. And I mean, this is unusual, he's an English, uh, well, Irishman, he's buried with full military honours in a stone tomb commissioned by Radama. Now, I know everything about um, tombs and ancestors in Madagascar, this would be a rare honour for a, a foreigner to be buried this way. And then Radama dies in 1828 at the age of 36, and then, if you know the next chapter in Madagascar history, things then start going pretty badly. Okay, so I wanted just to say something about what Hasty achieved. Um, so, you know, there's these very comprehensive accounts of agriculture, industry, landscape, birds, animals, flowers, blah, 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 you know, um, everything, you know, um, hairstyles, I mean, everything that he could collect house construct, everything that he could say about Madagascar at that time. But he helped the London Missionary Society gain its first entry there, uh, vouching for the missionaries. And so the Dharma who really doesn't care about religion at all, he doesn't really care about traditional religion, he certainly doesn't care about Christianity, Protestants, Catholics, whatever. Uh, mm. But he, but you know, he sees this as a way to get skills training um, you know for, for his people so he welcomes the missionaries and he said yeah you can do some schools and you know you can translate the bible if you want and do a dictionary but um, I really want you because you can teach blacksmithing and brick making and all of the other trades so um, Hasty manages to persuade Radama to abolish some harsh laws and customs reduce the penalties for some others <coughs> There's a notorious Tangena trial by poison ordeal that he is not able to eliminate. Uh, not able to do that, but um, you know he just makes some um, achievements there. Transforms the army, uh, working with uh, Sergeant Brady into what he wants to call a heavily laden mob of both sexes and all ages, into a more professional force, well equipped, which is now better able to conquer um, other parts of the country advocated for the building of roads, promoted cultivation of new crops, all sorts of things, cultivation of mulberry plantations for, for silk, new agricultural techniques. But, I mean, he knew, he, knew, he knew about soil conditions. You know, don't plant there, plant there. You should plant, try this crop here, not that crop. Um, now, these are some of the primary, principal primary sources that I use for research here. Um, uh, but I want to say something about can we say, the issues with Hasty's journals. And, they, and they're kind of all over the place. I did this during COVID. Fortunately, I had a wonderful colleague in Mauritius, Vijaya Tilo, who went down to the Mauritius National Archives and PDF'd numbers of pages for me. 
And that was good. I had collaboration from King's College London and a few other places as well. I'm going to talk about the 1821 journal in a moment here. Um, so here's, here's the problem. Most of the journals that we have are copies, or maybe copies of copies, or even copies of copies of copies. Okay? So are you dealing with a primary source or not? We don't know. This is an example. I get very excited when I discovered that the Cleveland Public Library, just five hours from where I live, you know, had Hasty Journal. Wow, that's great. So I went and I worked with them, but then when I compared them with the Mauritius National Archives versions, there were significant difference. Hasty wrote in a very flowery style, a lot of passive constructions and things like that. So, and whoever did this one, and uh, which ended up in the Cleveland collection there, used the active voice, omitted details and things like that. So you're always working with kind of incomplete data there. But this was very useful because there were parts of the Mauritius collection which are unreadable, they're faded or water damaged, so you sort of build it all together there. And um, also, there are some missing journals as well. I mean, Ellis quotes from hasty journals that don't exist anywhere else. There's a couple of other missionary historians, uh, Tyerman and Bennett, who also quote from a hasty journal that nobody has. Um, but my great discovery here, or the greatest moment for me, was to actually kind of locate one journal that nobody else knew about. So this is Pierre Larson, a very, very famous Madagascar historian. Fortunately, um, you know, he died in 2020. Um, and um, he, uh, this is one of his classic books, History and Memory in the Age of Enslavement. Becoming Mariner, I mean, it, it, you, know, um, you know, to kind of cultural and anthropological history is to that what I think Mervyn Brown is to political, military, and diplomatic history. So, in 2004, and this is my contact in Mauritius who said that, she said, ah, Pierre, she'd worked with him, she said, Pierre was looking for a journal that he heard was coming for auction in 2004, but he never found it. I went, oh, that's interesting. And I said, yeah, it's Christie's was auctioning it. I went, hmm, okay. Um, let, me, let me see if, what I can find here. So, I call Christie, of course, I have, no, no, we got no record of this, no record of this, no, no. So I go, well, let me see. If you've got a book by Hasty, and some of Hasty's stuff is bound with other journals, you know, as often happens with such sources, might it be part of a larger collection? And so I looked through the Christie's catalogue for 2004, April 2004, and there was something called the Quentin Keynes collection. Quentin Keynes was a um, an explorer, documentarian, filmmaker, British, um, a descendant of Charles Darwin, um, a, you know, a, 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 a relative of John Maynard Keynes, pretty, pretty prominent guy. And so the Keynes collection was auctioned in 2004 by Christie's in London, uh, expected to fetch three million pounds. I don't know if it did. So unless it's, uh, you know, Explorer, wildlife photographer, filmmaker. I mean, well, a large collection. So I thought, hmm, let me see about that. Um, uh, 500 lots in the collection. So I, I, I went back to Christie and I said, please, 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 look for me. See if there was anything from James Hasty there. And eventually they came up with this. Lot number 0167. Aha! And so I said, okay, so you know, who bought lot one thing? And they said, it didn't sell. It didn't sell at auction. I said, so what happened to it? Okay, if it didn't sell. Oh, journalist, I'm persistent. I don't give up on these things. Right? <laughs> uh, and so they said, well, anything that was unsold, we would have returned to um, Quentin Keynes's executor. I said, so who's that? I said, well, it's, it's Simon Keynes, who is a Professor Emeritus of Anglo-Saxon History at Trinity College, Cambridge. So I thought, okay. So I contact him and he says, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I had that and I sold it later in the year. Let me go back to my place in Norfolk to see if I can find it. But Simon Keynes was very, very obliging 
and he revealed to me that he had sold it to a British textile designer, a long-time resident of Madagascar, called, called Simon Pierce, who does... <laughs> <laughs> oh, we know Simon Pierce. Okay, so, so I, I, I don't know how... I've never heard of Simon Pierce, so I, I, I have to track down Simon Pierce. I, and and um, Simon Keynes does not have an email address for him. So I go, let's see, so I'll Google on that and search around. I find he's got an exhibition somewhere in London. Contact the exhibition organisers, they say, we'll pass on your inquiry. They do. And he responds. And he says, it's COVID now. Can't get to my house in France. But when I do, I'll, I'll get it. And he sends me a transcription. And that's the 1821 journal. So, it, I mean, with some persistence on my part and a very generous gesture from Simon Piers, I was able to sort of piece together, you know, another part of the story. So, um... As I say, this is dedicated to Sir Mervyn Brown. I would not have done this without his inspiration, and I, you know, I, I wish him a happy hundredth birthday. I wish I could join him there, but honestly, I mean, you know, uh, um, you know, he, he turned me on to Hasty, and Hasty became an important part of my life. If you're interested in the book, it's 15, and I will be happy to autograph it for you. And I mean, as you can tell from the way I present. I mean, I'm an ac somebody wrote, wrote, I once got a review which said he's an academic who does not write like an academic. So I've taken, I've taken this story and I mean, I can, I can document everything in it, but I try to write it in a, um, you know, a style which would not be unfamiliar to people who enjoy fiction. Okay, so there's, so there's action, there's drama, there's, there's, there's plot there, because it is plot. You know, I mean, this is a fascinating, this is a fascinating, fascinating plot. So I think you'll find it a good read. Happy to take any questions, but thank you so much. <laughs>